Yeah, thanks. Welcome everyone to another edition of the uh, Origin Seminar uh, brought to you by University of Arizona. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Ilaria Pascucci. Uh, Ilaria got her PhD in 2004 at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Astronomy, working with um, Professor Thomas Henning, is that right? I think so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and shortly after she moved to the, to the US, uh, she spent four years um, at the University of Arizona as a research associate before leaving for a little bit uh, to go to Baltimore, uh, work at Space Telescope um, and Johns Hopkins University. And then she came back in 2011. Um, and she's been researching everything related to planet formation and protoplanetary disks, I guess, uh, ever since. She's also uh, part of the uh, Nexus uh, framework and uh, uh, part of the organizing committee for the upcoming Proto Stars and Planets uh, 7 meeting. So it's really great to have her here uh, today. I hope you enjoy her talk. Before she uh, give it over to Ilaria, uh, please hold on to your uh, questions until the Q&A uh, session after the talk. But if you have a, a short clarification question, you can um, just type it in the chat and uh, if, it's, if it's important enough, um, the organizers will interrupt Ilaria and, and ask it to clarify. And please keep yourself muted uh, during the talk. But yeah, enjoy. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Let me try to share my screen. Can you all uh, see my screen? And also, can you hear me well? Yeah, yes. okay, good. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, the opportunity to present the work uh, that we have done in the past years in relation to uh, these queens. Before starting uh, with the uh, results, I want to acknowledge my collaborators who are listed down here. In particular, my uh, longtime collaborators, Uma Gorti and Susan Edwards, with whom I had so many discussions about these queens and also a former student, Molly Simon, and former postdocs, Andrea Banzatti and Min Fang. I will uh, highlight some of their excellent work uh, in this presentation. And finally, um, uh, the large collaboration uh, that we had with the uh, VLT uh, this year large program, and I'm very happy that today I can also uh, present some of the results uh, from this large survey. So first of all, uh, I want to uh, mention what I define as these queens uh, uh, in this uh, presentation. So this is a simple sketch of a star and the disk of dust here in gray and gas in, uh, uh, in white. And these, uh, these queens are outflowing gas from a few scale height from the disk midplane, which are highlighted here uh, uh, with these arrows pointing uh, outward. I will be discussing uh, MHD, uh, these queens, uh, as well as uh, photoevaporative winds. For the purpose of the talk, uh, I want you to um, uh, just uh, uh, focus on a few distinctions uh, with, in relation to these uh, winds. So the MHD, these queens, uh, they require a kind of a background magnetic field, uh, which uh, could be the leftover of uh, the planet formation process. And as you can see, uh, can see illustrated here, they can uh, also act uh, in the inner part of the disk. We will see later they can also be more uh, extended. Uh, in contrast, uh, photoevaporative winds, uh, uh, they occur in the outer part uh, of the disk. They do not require uh, a magnetic field because they are driven by high energy photons, uh, uh, stellar photons, UV and also X-rays. Um, from, from the star. Uh, so what they do is that they heat and ionize uh, the disk surface such that beyond uh, a certain radius, which is typically called the critical radius, the uh, sound speed um, uh, becomes larger than the um, Keplerian uh, velocity. And so uh, this is also called, in fact, uh, a thermal wind. So a couple of distinction, MHD needs uh, a uh, magnetic field and they can be also inside. The photoevaporative, they don't need it and they are mostly outside. So what is the role of these winds uh, in the evolution uh, and dispersal of, of disks? So I want to start uh, with this uh, classic evolutionary sketch which was put together for Protostars and Planet 6. 
So in the upper panel, what you see uh, is the earliest stages of uh, uh, disk evolution. So it's a full dust and gas disk in which you could have uh, both uh, uh, MHD winds as well as photoevaporative winds acting at the same time. The evolution of the disk uh, was thought to be driven mostly uh, by turbulent transport. So most of the angular momentum uh, is redistributed outward uh, in the disk, and that enables a bit of disk matter to be accreted onto the central star. So it's turbulent transport that drives uh, uh, evolution in this type of classic disks. As the mass accretion rate onto the star declines and becomes uh, below, lower than the mass loss rate uh, from uh, the photoevaporative wind, then a gap can open uh, in the disk. Uh, therefore, material from the outer disk is not resupplied anymore to the inner disk. The inner disk then quickly, on a viscous time scale, uh, accretes onto the central star, and the outer disk uh, is also quickly um, dispersed through, uh, again, this high energy stellar photon that uh, heat and ionize uh, uh, the disk outer region. So in this classic picture, uh, photoevaporative winds uh, have, uh, uh, are critical for the final dispersal of disks. And there are a number of implications for planet formation and migration. For uh, simplicity, I'm going to mention just, uh, and for uh, time available, I'm just going to mention a couple of them. Uh, so one is that it has been shown that photoevaporation can promote planetesimal formation uh, via uh, streaming instability. And I'm happy that Carrera is here. So if you have any questions, you can ask him. And then uh, uh, the other thing that we have also looked at uh, is that uh, uh, giant planets can get stranded in photoevaporating disks, and therefore uh, they can produce uh, um, structures in the uh, giant planet uh, distributions, uh, some of which uh, uh, we, we actually see. <clears throat> so, but since uh, uh, also protostars and planet six, uh, um, uh, theorists have done, uh, uh, started to do more detailed uh, calculations of uh, uh, disk evolution, and they found out that actually turbulent transport was not uh, that efficient, uh, especially in the planet-forming region. So uh, a, an idea, um, I would say, uh, resurrected because um, it was uh, initially proposed ma much earlier, uh, but now um, the, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, these queens uh, actually drive uh, evolution by extracting angular momentum as it is illustrated here by these arrows from the disk surface and that extraction of angular momentum enables uh, accretion of uh, disk gas onto the star. Now in this emerging paradigm you can imagine that actually these queens have a more prominent role uh, in the evolution and in fact uh, it has been shown uh, um, in a number of papers and this is uh, just one for reference that the surface density evolution of these disks uh, is different <coughs> excuse me from uh, the viscous uh, classical disks. So what you have here in this plot is the surface density multiplied by radial distance as a function of radial distance the classic disks are shown here in blue, and there are two different flavors of uh, um, wind-driven accretion disks, uh, depending on uh, how the magnetic flux uh, evolves. And you can see that the evolution of this surface density is indeed quite different, which matters for uh, planet formation and migration. Uh, so again, these are just two examples, but it has been shown that uh, uh, it is important, uh, this different evolution for the um, migration of super Earth. So now not only for giant planets, we're talking also for much smaller and numerous uh, super Earth uh, like planets. And uh, also we have heard uh, in one of the previous origin talks, uh, uh, an interesting connection between these queens and the possibility of depletion of moderately volatile elements in meteorites. So a connection with uh, uh, our, the origin of our solar system. Uh, one important implication of these models is that MHD queens uh, now uh, being more prominent uh, uh, also uh, extract a lot of mass from the disk. So the mass loss rate from this wind could be as much as uh, uh, the mass accretion rate. So from an um, observational point of view, uh, we want to understand how common are these disks around young stars. 
are these queens uh, radially extended as in this emerging paradigm to drive uh, this uh, accretion onto the star? And are wind mass flow rate uh, actually uh, significant? Uh, so I tell you up front that I will not be able to answer all these questions, but I want to show you that uh, we made significant progress in uh, at least partially answering uh, these questions. So let's start by um, reviewing how are we going to detect uh, these queens uh, uh, observationally. So what we look at is, uh, or what we search for, is unbound gas from the disk surface. So it means that this unbound gas will have a different velocity with respect uh, to the stellar velocity. Now, just to sketch out what uh, uh, you would see, <clears throat> here is a simulation of a disk that is seen face on from the observer. And uh, um, uh, the emission from the surface of this uh, uh, flowing gas from the disk is highlighted in color. Uh, so if this disk is face on, then you, uh, you take a high resolution uh, spectrum of this object. Uh, you cannot spatially resolve the emission, but when you look at the line profile, you will see that the um, bulk of the emission is blue shifted with respect to the stellar velocity. So in general, uh, high resolution spectroscopy at a resolution better than 10 kilometers per second has been quite successful uh, to uh, detect uh, outflowing gas. So these are uh, four examples of uh, these queen diagnostics that we um, uh, highlighted in this uh, review chapter with uh, uh, Barbara Colano a few years ago. Uh, I have to tell you that I'm truly excited about spectrostrometry uh, in the CO, or vibrational transition, and also by the ALMA results. However, at the moment, uh, what we have here are just a handful of objects, so we cannot draw uh, conclusions on the population. So I will be focusing uh, today on the upper two diagnostics, since there uh, we could make uh, uh, significant progress. So let's start from uh, um, the ionized neon at 12.8 microns, so uh, infrared wavelengths, uh, ground-based high-resolution observations. Um, so here what you see is an example of, uh, uh, I would say, perhaps the best uh, case for uh, uh, photoevaporating uh, disk. Here we have uh, the uh, data, which are in black. Again, zero is the stellar velocity. And you can see that uh, the emission is clearly uh, blue shifty. Uh, this is a disk uh, that is face on and has a dust cavity. And therefore, uh, you, uh, because the bulk of the emission is blue shifty, we know that it cannot come from inside the dust cavity, which is optically thin to, uh, to the line. If that would be the case, we wouldn't see any net blue shift. So the blue shift itself and the dust cavity are telling us that the emission is coming beyond that dust cavity. Um, and if you calculate what is the critical radius for this object, you can see that it's beyond, uh, the dust radius is beyond the critical radius. So this is a very good um, uh, indication that could be uh, a photoevaporative uh, wind. Overplotted onto these, um, uh, data, there are also two different types of uh, photoevaporative wind. One in red, in which uh, uh, photoevaporation is driven by extreme UV photons, and another in blue, in which it is driven by X-ray photons. And you see that both of them, uh, they uh, reproduce relatively well the observed profile. However, the expected mass loss rates uh, uh, from these two different models differ by uh, more than, uh, by almost two order of magnitudes. Uh, so uh, it became important at that time to figure out uh, uh, which, uh, what is the neon tracing. tracing. Is it tracing uh, material that is ionized by UV photons or the one by X-rays? So to answer this question, we actually devised uh, um, uh, an interesting and different approach. So we figure out that if you have a, a partially uh, or fully ionized disk, sur disk surface, that surface will emit free-free uh, radiation, mostly at centimeter wavelengths. So what you can do uh, is what is illustrated here with uh, one particular object. You can uh, um, 
observe the object at multiple wavelengths covering millimeter wavelengths where most of the emission is dust thermal emission and centimeter wavelengths where you start to see an excess on top of uh, uh, that thermal emission. Now, if that is due to free-free emission from the ionized surface of the disk, you can also calculate an upper limit on the uh, EUV luminosity that reaches the surface of the disk. Then you can couple this type of measurement with the uh, EUV radiation or luminosity that you would need to um, produce the observed uh, neon to line uh, fluxes. So if you do that, uh, then uh, here on the y-axis, you have the upper limit from the free-free emission. On the x-axis, you have what you will need to produce the observed neon to luminosity. And what you find by this plot uh, is many objects follow below the one-to-one -one line, which means that uh, in general, there doesn't appear to be enough uh, UV photons to reproduce observed uh, neon to luminosities. So, oh, by the way, this is the uh, TW Hydra disk, so uh, the one I've shown before. So this also follows in the region below which there would be, uh, uh, there are too few uh, UV photons um, to uh, ionize neon. So what we have learned, excuse me, I went too fast, is that not only uh, neon 2 at 12.8 micron traces uh, flowing gas, but also that it traces gas that is ionized by hard X-rays. And this will become important in the end uh, when, when I will merge uh, different uh, wind diagnostics. All right, so now back to this figure, uh, I want to uh, highlight some of the progress uh, that we made uh, in relation to optical forbidden lines. So uh, when we started to uh, uh, a survey to learn more about these objects, uh, we, uh, about this phenomena. Uh, we looked into the forbidden lines because there was already excellent work done in the 90s showing uh, that uh, um, these lines trace some outflowing gas. In particular, it was um, uh, found that uh, in higher craters like the Artau, these lines are complex. They show uh, what is called the high velocity component because it comes out at hundreds of kilometers per second, but also a low velocity component, so emission at lower velocity. It was found that that emission at lower velocity remains for low accretion. So it was uh, concluded that the high velocity uh, traces jets and by now, there are uh, very nice high resolution images of uh, some of these jets, like this one here from HH30. This is an edge on disk, so you can see here the emission from the disk and the oxygen one showing this uh, uh, collimated uh, high velocity emission. It was also found that the lower velocity component uh, is typically blue shifted with respect to the velocity of the star. And uh, Kwan and Tademaru already in 1995 proposed uh, that uh, this could be uh, a disk wind. So what we were after uh, is basically this question, which type of disk wind does it trace? Is it an MHD wind or is it a photolaborative wind? So that's when we started this uh, Keck Iris survey of uh, uh, Tauri stars in Tauros uh, with former student uh, Molly Simon. And we employed a resolution that is more than twice better than the one available in the 90s, and also a more sensitive uh, uh, observation, so integrating deeper uh, to uh, look better at the line profiles. Uh, these are examples of profiles that we acquired. In this paper, uh, we uh, study both the oxygen-1-6300, the 5577, also the sulfur uh, forbidden line, but for uh, the sake of time, I will be focusing only on the oxygen one uh, 6300. So one thing that uh, uh, we noticed was that uh, even the low velocity emission, uh, which is uh, in uh, blue and red, uh, could not be um, attributed just to one velocity component, which for simplicity and the lack of models with fit uh, with one Gaussian. But in many cases, you need to fit uh, uh, two different kinematic components. 
And uh, uh, one of the most important results from this uh, paper of Molly is that, uh, at least for the broad component, there is no doubt that that is coming from an MHD disk wind because uh, the, uh, uh, the components are blue shifted and so it's a, a flowing gas and at the same time, uh, the lines are so broad that cannot be reproduced uh, by a photoevaporative wind. So it has to come from some flowing gas inside uh, the uh, critical radius. Uh, we also corroborated these uh, earlier results uh, and expanded upon them that there appears to be an evolution in the oxygen one profiles as disks uh, uh, evolve. So here you can see an example of a, a full disk, an example of a disk with a cavi cavity, and an example of a disk, uh, sorry, I wanted to say gaps, and uh, an example of disk with uh, a cavity. Uh, we were also very happy uh, two years after when uh, uh, McGuinness and collaborators, uh, a completely different team uh, using a different instrument and analyzing a different star forming region, uh, basically recovered uh, the same results uh, uh, that we published in 2016. So what was left uh, to understand was uh, uh, what is this narrow component that seems to persist uh, through this uh, evolution. And so this is where uh, the work of uh, former postdoc Andrea Banzatti uh, came in. He did an excellent job in expanding uh, the sample. So now uh, not only CLEC IRA spectra, but also uh, including Magellan Mike spectra of stars in different star forming regions. Again, very high resolution and sensitivity. So this is one of the plots from uh, uh, Andrea's paper, summarizing the different components that uh, uh, we see in this large sample. Uh, on the y-axis, you see the full width of maximum of the component as a function of uh, uh, the centroid emission, so the peak velocity of these components. And again, uh, you can see a number of uh, jets uh, emission, but also in uh, red and blue, uh, the, uh, disc, uh, the disc winds. So uh, Andrea's paper is really a, a very comprehensive analysis and I encourage all of you to uh, read the paper if you are interested uh, in these topics. But uh, for the uh, time available, I will be concentrating only on one result from, uh, from this nice analysis. And this is where Andrea combines the um, uh, results for sources where you can see uh, both uh, a broad and a narrow component uh, in the low velocity emission, which are illustrated in red and blue. And these are just two examples. So what we find is that uh, uh, the kinematics of these components are correlated. So on this panel, on the left, you can see the centroid of the two emission. In the middle panel, you can see the full width of maximum. And in the last panel, you can see the equivalent width. And all of the three are correlated. So our interpretation in this uh, paper was that because we know that uh, the broad emission is uh, coming from an MHD uh, disk wind, uh, this uh, kinematics correlation are suggestive that also the narrow component could be part of the same uh, MHD wind. And then uh, uh, if uh, this gas has not completely lost uh, um, information from the launching radio, radius, the uh, full width of maximum of these components uh, tells you uh, something about the radial extent of this wind. So as far as our tracers enable, we can see that uh, uh, this, this wind is relatively extended out to uh, five AU. So, if uh, these oxygen forbidden lines uh, really trace, uh, the low velocity emission really trace an MHD disk wind, how can we estimate uh, wind mass loss rates? And this is uh, where uh, the work of former postdoc Ming Fang, uh, Ming Fang uh, uh, really was uh, uh, essential. But before answering uh, this question, Min had to answer uh, an intermediate question. Uh, we really needed to understand uh, if uh, these uh, oxygen lines are uh, thermally excited. 
If they are, then we can use line ratios to learn about uh, um, the uh, gas property in a relatively simple way. If they are not, and for instance, the oxygen one comes from OH dissociation, then uh, uh, things get more complicated. So what Ming did uh, was to gather a sample of sources where uh, we had these three different lines covered at the same time. Uh, in particular, we were interested in the oxygen 1, 6,300 and the sulfur 2 at 4,068 Armstrong because they have very similar critical density. So we argued that if the line profiles of individual components are similar, then the oxygen lines must be thermally excited because you cannot produce uh, sulfur 2 from uh, OH dissociation. So this is a very important plot uh, in Min's paper, and you can see uh, the oxygen 1, 6,300 uh, uh, in these uh, colored uh, field areas for the different components, so narrow and broad, and the sulfur 2, uh, 4,068 angstrom with this dash dotted line. And what you can see from this plot is that for most sources, uh, the profiles uh, are very similar. So we concluded in this paper that the oxygen lines are thermally excited. Therefore, we can use the line ratio to constrain the gas properties. So this is what we did uh, in this other plot uh, in this paper. On the y-axis, you have uh, the ratio of the sulfur 2 over, over the oxygen 1. And on the x-axis, you have uh, uh, the ratio of the uh, two oxygen forbidden lines. Uh, so data are with these uh, circles, um, blue for the narrow emission and red for the broad emission. And these dashed and dotted lines are uh, um, models of gas uh, that is thermally excited by collisions uh, with electrons. And uh, we would have wanted to do collisions with hydrogen, but it's not possible. And if you want, I can tell you why in the discussion. So uh, if you look at this plot, uh, you can uh, uh, have information about the typical properties of the gas that is producing these forbidden lines. So we think that you need high temperatures, which is actually not surprising because if you look at the excitation temperature of the oxygen one, you will see that is 6,300 is above 20,000 Kelvin. So you need hot gas but you also need a, a pretty dense uh, uh, gas uh, of, this, of this order. You can use this, uh, this information then to derive uh, wind mass loss rates. And that's what Min did uh, in, uh, in the paper. Actually, he derived average mass loss, wind mass loss rate uh, with respect to mass accretion rates because he also calculated uh, self-consistently uh, mass accretion rates for this sample from the same spectra. And this is um, a, a very nice plot uh, in his paper. Uh, wind mass loss rate over mass accretion rate on the y-axis as a function of the temperature of the gas, which we have constrained uh, between 5,000 and 10,000 Kelvin. So we show the data uh, results in this way because first of all, there is a dependence with the temperature. So it would be valuable to have better constraints on the gas temperature. Uh, and also we show uh, three different uh, set of average values in these uh, square uh, circles and diamonds, uh, because there is another parameter which uh, we did not appreciate is so important before uh, making this calculation. And this is the vertical extent of uh, the wind uh, in these forbidden lines, which we are completely blind uh, through our observations. So the upper curve is for uh, a wind that in the oxygen one is as extended as uh, the radial location that we can infer from the full width of maximum. The intermediate set of values are for a wind that is 10 times more extended. And the last one, a wind in the oxygen one that is 100 times more extended. So uh, one uh, in uh, suggestion here in the paper is that we really need uh, to constrain uh, the wind height in these forbidden lines if we want to use them uh, to measure mass loss rate.
Okay, so now I want to, um, going back to this classic picture, uh, just uh, very quickly review what we have uh, um, um, mentioned in terms of diagnostics. So uh, we have found that especially in this, uh, uh, with the dust cavity, the uh, infrared uh, um, neon 2 emission at 12.8 microns seems to trace an outer wind that is consistent with uh, uh, photoevaporation models. Uh, when we did the uh, survey at uh, optical wavelengths and studying the optical forbidden lines, uh, we found evidence from our study that uh, the low velocity emission appears to trace uh, instead an inner MHD disk wind. So um, we wanted really to have a sample where we can look at both diagnostics uh, at the same time in the same object. And we could do that thanks uh, to the uh, VLT VCR large program, uh, which uh, uh, used uh, 24 nights of VLT time, uh, mostly uh, to uh, look at the uh, chemistry of this. So there are um, molecular tracer in, uh, that have been chosen for this large sample of this. Uh, but uh, one uh, goal that was also uh, important to me and my collaborators was to look at the NEON2 and try to combine the oxygen-1 um, diagnostics with the NEON2 uh, diagnostics. Uh, so um, a colleague of mine actually a couple of days ago told me that, uh, reminded me that we uh, started thinking about proposal, this proposal in 2011. Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, completely true. Uh, sometimes you need to be patient. Uh, but I have to say, and I want to uh, say that, uh, to thank a lot uh, the uh, ESO uh, staff, uh, because this year had a number of problems uh, throughout uh, the um, uh, development and installation on, on telescopes, and they were really um, great uh, in uh, um, solving these issues and being able to provide uh, to the community uh, this, uh, this instrument. So thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, in this uh, uh, new paper, which is now in press and should appear soon uh, uh, on AstroPH, again, uh, the goal was to combine uh, optical and infrared uh, diagnostics. So we found uh, a sample of 31 objects uh, with high resolution spectra, where we cover both the oxygen one at 6,300 angstrom and the neon two at 12.8 uh, uh, micron. So these are uh, some examples from uh, uh, the new uh, VCR uh, survey uh, of these round young stars. Uh, so you can see uh, in green um, is what I highlighted as high velocity component. You can see it comes out at hundreds of kilometers per second. And in purple are examples of uh, low velocity emission. Uh, so, um, uh, working at infrared wavelengths is, I have to say, more challenging than optical wavelengths. Uh, they, uh, you can see the quality of the spectra, uh, but also the spectral resolution of this year is uh, not as high as the one uh, at optical wavelengths. And therefore, uh, we couldn't make, uh, or it, it's actually not justified to go on and uh, identify additional components within the low velocity emission. So in this paper, we treat the low velocity emission as uh, one unique component. Uh, one interesting result that we found by looking at this survey is that when we detect uh, the neon two emission, we either detect it as high velocity component or as low velocity component. This is, uh, as you remember, if you remember, very different from the oxygen one 6300, where for high accretors, the high velocity component is always, uh, almost always accompanied by the low velocity emission. This is not the case for the neon two. Uh, we also looked at the distribution of our sources in terms of stellar properties, like uh, uh, luminosity, X-ray luminosity, mass accretion rate, the oxygen one luminosity. And also we introduced uh, uh, this, um, we looked also into this other quantity, uh, which is the infrared spectral index. So the infrared spectral index was already pointed out by Furlan and collaborators in 2009, that is a good indicator for the depletion of the dust uh, inner disk. And what we see from our uh, survey is that for uh, more depleted 
dust disk, uh, what we observe uh, is only the low velocity uh, emission, no high velocity emission. So Ilana, before you go ahead, there is some, some yes. uh, question in chat. Yes, I think should, yeah. yeah. Uh, I so don't the see first, them. Yeah, so first, I think Andrew was asking about how does making wind more extended, lower end dot uh, wind. Ah, yes, I have actually, uh, if you don't mind, Andrew, I can show you that at the end of the presentation, I have the equation somewhere, but they are at the end. Uh, it really- uh, Josh provided uh, an explanation in the chat as well that makes sense to me, so thanks. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah so sorry, there was I, the next, yeah, there was the next thing I was going to tell her. So yeah. Josh said, that is it because of wind? Yeah. yeah, Josh has said, is it because the wind is optically thick? So given M dot plus higher surface area, uh, leads to higher obs uh, observed uh, flux. Uh, no, that's not the case. It's the mass through the wind that changes. So if you want, uh, okay, maybe I should just go to one of the last. Uh, um, let me see where I have it. Uh, there. Okay, so the emission, because this is a forbidden line, uh, we find it extremely unlikely that the emission is optically thick. So in fact, uh, um, we think it should be thin. And so uh, from the um, luminosity, you can have an idea of the, of the density. The wind height come out here because this is a mass loss through the wind. So there is a wind velocity as, as well as the vertical extent of the wind that play a role in, uh, uh, in this equation. So that's uh, the reason. Uh, is that answering your question? One more question by John. Okay, okay then yeah. I... I move back and yeah, analysis so from yeah analysis from 90s of wind mass loss rates and accretion rates by Hardigan and Edwards et al. concluded the ratio was 0.1 with large errors. Is that still where we are? Um, no, for us not because I mean if you look at this uh, um, the, uh, that I showed you, depending again on uh, how. Okay, so I should make a clarification. There. Um, um, ratio was in relation to the jet. In relation to the jet, yes, that's where we are. And uh, the paper of mean also look at the mass loss rate through the jet. But uh, for the wind, uh, you can expect that mass loss rate is higher. And this plot uh, from the paper of mean shows that depending on the wind height, it could be higher. But the reality is that we don't know how extend is the wind. So, um, I don't have a, a full answer on what is the ratio. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Is that sufficient? Or... Okay, then uh, I, uh, I go ahead. And if you have additional questions on this, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer later. Um, okay, so I was here and I, um, what I wanted to say is that uh, in this paper, th we then looked uh, at the uh, correlation, possible correlation or, or absence of them, uh, of the uh, luminosity uh, of the, uh, these forbidden lines with the, some of the disk parameters. And we chose uh, uh, these specific disk parameters because we know that the uh, oxygen one luminosity, which is on the X axis here, um, is known to correlate uh, with some of them. In particular, uh, if you look at larger sample of, uh, uh, of larger surveys than, than ours, uh, only using the uh, forbidden oxygen one, uh, we know that the low velocity emission correlates with uh, stellar luminosity uh, as an even stronger correlation with mass accretion rate and is anti-correlated with the uh, infrared spectral index and there is no correlation with the uh, X-ray luminosities. Then uh, uh, we looked uh, at the uh, possible uh, relation now with the uh, neon two luminosities, or now the neon two is on the X axis. And you see that unlike uh, with the oxygen one, uh, there are a number of upper limits here, which are indicated with this uh, um, triangle pointed to the left. And, um, Considering the detections in the low velocity component and the upper limits, uh, we find uh, me, that there is only one possible positive correlation now. And this is between uh, the neon two luminosity 
and now uh, the uh, interspectral index. So what we conclude in the paper is that while the oxygen one luminosity decreases as the inner dust disk is depleted, the neon two luminosity increases. We also use uh, uh, these plots in, uh, in the paper to better highlight uh, uh, this point. So here you see now the line ratios of the two forbidden lines for the low, uh, low velocity emission as a function of the uh, infraspectral index. And you see that for full disks, which are uh, in this side of the plot, there are many sensitive upper limits on the neon two line. Uh, and even for sources like Ario lupus and VW Cha, where we detect a high velocity emission, again, we have no indication of a low velocity, of a low, low velocity emission. Uh, in the paper, we also look at line profiles, both for the high velocity and for the low velocity. Uh, given the topic of this uh, talk, I'm going to restrict myself to the low velocity emission. Uh, so here in the sample, uh, you can uh, probably recognize many uh, this with uh, cavities and, and gaps um, on the left panel. And so one thing we found, uh, which uh, expands on what we found in 2011 on TW Hydra, is that discs with a dust cavity have oxygen one that is typically centered at the stellar velocity and is indicated here by these black circles, while the neon two uh, is more blue shifted. And you can see here the um, purple circle. So this is telling us that the oxygen one is radially closer uh, than the neon two. In the bottom panel, uh, we looked at the full width of maximum as a function of disk inclination. And what we found is a moderate uh, uh, possible correlation uh, between the full width of maximum of the neon two line and uh, the inclination of the disk. So larger full width for more inclined disks, which could suggest that the oxygen one, uh, the neon two, sorry, uh, being in this uh, wind has not completely lost the Keplerian signature from uh, its launching region. So let me uh, briefly uh, summarize the key observational results uh, uh, in this new paper. Uh, so first of all, of all 17 sources with neon two detections, we have either a detection of a high velocity component or a low velocity component, while we know from the oxygen one that the high velocity component is often accompanied by the low velocity emission. Then we have seen that the oxygen one luminosity decreases as the inner dust is depleted, while the neon two luminosities increase. The neon two uh, luminosity um, uh, in the low velocity emission, the profiles are more blue shifted than the oxygen one, and the majority of full disks uh, um, have a low velocity oxygen one detection, which is indicative of this inner MHD winds, but uh, 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 do not have this uh, neon two uh, low velocity emission. So how do we explain uh, all these uh, results? Uh, before showing you this uh, schematic picture that we put together, uh, there are uh, two other points to uh, consider. First of all, uh, this is what I mentioned earlier, um, there is evidence, uh, observational evidence, that neon atoms are likely ionized by hard X-rays. Uh, also, we find unlikely that the oxygen one traces a fully ionized uh, UV region because the ionization of oxygen is similar to the one of hydrogen, so you would expect oxygen two, and we looked uh, um, of this in, in the, uh, for this diagnostics in the paper of Molly Simon, and we didn't find that. The other important point is that the excitation temperature of neon two is lower than the one of oxygen. So it's only about a thousand, while the one of oxygen one is uh, 20,000. So uh, putting these key observational results together with other, uh, these other points to consider, uh, this is what we came up uh, to explain uh, the two types of disks that we have uh, in our survey the full disks on the top and disks with dust cavity on the bottom. So uh, full, for full disks, uh, what we think, uh, what, what we have evidence for are the presence of jets. We see them in the oxygen one, we see them in the neon two in the high velocity emission. Uh, we also have evidence of inner MHD wind through the oxygen one low velocity emission. Uh, 
uh, I did not mention this, but for two of our sources, uh, there are also uh, spec there is also spectroastrometry in the CO vibrational line, which is indicative of winds. This is from the work of Pontopidan and collaborators in 2011. So um, again, uh, evidence for this inner MHD winds. And so we think that the oxygen one is likely uh, tracing uh, really the, the most exposed part of, of this wind towards the star where soft X-rays are absorbed. The hard X-rays, they penetrate further, but uh, this being a likely a, a molecular uh, wind, it cools efficiently. And by cooling efficiently, it doesn't produce much of the neon to low velocity emission. So this is why in this type of disks, we only detect the uh, neon to high velocity and not the low velocity. An interesting implication here, if, uh, if this is true and hard X-rays are absorbed here, then it's unlikely that they can uh, uh, go further out and uh, uh, help in, a, in an outer wind. Okay, so we don't have evidence from our own diagnostics for the existence of this outer wind. However, uh, as time goes on and this um, uh, dust is depleted in the inner disk and many of these uh, transition uh, dust disks with cavities that we have uh, um, are, have also lower mass accretion rate, then this inner MHD wind could be more tenuous. Uh, so there could be uh, still evidence of uh, a wind, although we cannot probe it uh, directly because the oxygen one line is uh, basically at zero uh, location uh, because if it comes from the inner part, which is optically thin. So we see the red shifted and the blue shifted component. Uh, however, if this uh, inner wind is really more tenuous as we propose, then uh, hard X-rays could penetrate further and they could arrive, uh, reach the, uh, the surface of the disk beyond the dust cavity where they can uh, ionize neon and start this uh, flowing material uh, further out. Um, all right, so how can we test this uh, uh, sketch uh, that we put together? Uh, so first of all, I think uh, uh, we should be doing more spectrostrometry, uh, not only uh, in the oxygen one, because as I mentioned, it will be important to measure the uh, vertical extent of this wind, but also in the CO to check really if these winds are mostly molecular as we uh, uh, really uh, speculate at this point. Then uh, we should be doing definitely more work to detect outer winds. Uh, so uh, we could use, for instance, the oxygen one at 63 micron with Sophia Great. And also we should be doing more of the ALMA observations. Uh, so moving into longer wavelengths, I think will be very beneficial. But keep in mind the work at uh, short wavelengths so that we can have a more comprehensive view of, of these winds. And then finally, in relation with uh, this with dust cavity, some of these cavities are really large and, uh, and the neon tube being blue shifted, it suggests that it's coming from beyond this dust cavity. So in a few cases, we could do some uh, specially resolved JWST MIRI images to really nail down uh, the extension of the neon tube uh, in these objects. So that's all I wanted to say. I leave here uh, these uh, take home uh, messages. And uh, before concluding, I want to thank uh, the National Science Foundation uh, for supporting our work, as well as NASA through the Earth in Other Solar Systems uh, program. And I also want to mention that we provided to the community uh, all the high resolution spectra that we uh, fully reduced, that we uh, acquired, and uh, I hope uh, you will find them useful in uh, your studies. Thank you. Thanks, Ilaria. Um, yeah, questions. There was some further discussion in the uh, chat. Miguel, did you want to, to ask your question still? Um, well, maybe I can just ask um, if Ilaria can uh, confirm what I took away from uh, the equation showing the M dot uh, mm -hmm. derivation. Uh, yeah. So is, is the key point that while you can measure from the line flux the mass and you can measure the 
uh, typical velocity of the wind material, you have no spectral or spatial information about the spatial extent of the wind, and that's why you need to assume something for the for the height. Did we get that, that right? That is correct. We have no information about the spatial extent. We only know the characteristic velocity from uh, the peak of the emission uh, and uh, from the oxygen one luminosity, uh, we know the mass because the emission is optically thin. Of course, we have to make uh, an assumption on the oxygen to hydrogen uh, H2 ratio. Yeah, okay, that's correct. Thanks. And that's why I'm saying, uh, so we are actually uh, working with my collaborator, Emma Whelan, so I can advertise this uh, work a bit. I mean, she has done an excellent job in uh, looking at the spectrostrometry, for instance, in the oxygen one, 6,300 of vario lupus, and uh, uh, she can uh, uh, specially resolve the emission. So this is, uh, I think this would be very nice uh, to, to do it on a larger sample. The next question was from uh, Ninke. Ninke writes, thanks for a great talk, Laria. There's more and more observational evidence for low viscosity disks uh, with alpha of 10 minus three or lower. Does this affect the disk winds as well? What are the consequences for disk evolution and dissipation? Uh, yes, so I mean, yeah, this is an excellent point. Uh, so there are, um, there was a recent paper uh, in particular by uh, Flaherty and uh, collaborators uh, looking at the uh, viscosity in the outer disk as observed by ALMA. And as far as I remember, there was only one object, I think it's DM tau that uh, uh, is consistent with some uh, turbulence in the outer disk. Uh, so this goes back, uh, if you want, to this um, uh, slide here. Um, let me share the screen again, uh, where, um, you know, more theorists uh, are leaning towards uh, uh, MHT disk winds uh, uh, playing a, a major role in, in the disk evolution. I think these are uh, very interesting and important results, and um, I think uh, observers should try to uh, provide uh, uh, observations to test uh, these emerging uh, theories. So yeah, the idea would be uh, that these queens would uh, dominate the, the evolution. Yeah. yeah. Next up was um, Joan. Uh, she asks, if x-rays are absorbed in the wind, are they unavailable to ionize the disk? Or how much of the stellar x-rays are needed to explain the wind properties? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, I, uh, so based on the uh, data that we have at the moment, uh, I have no evidence that uh, the X-rays are available to ionize the wind, the, 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 sorry, the surface of the disk. So let's go back uh, here. Um, uh, because if in, in these full disks, if uh, uh, they would ionize the disk, then we could have expected to see some low velocity emission at the, at the disk location. Now, how much are they fully absorbed or is there still some ionization uh, for the disk? There could be, uh, it would be nice to have a model to, to test, uh, to test this, uh, this possibility. That, that there could be some and we are not sensitive uh, to that one. Uh, but I encourage you to, to look at these upper limits in the paper uh, to, uh, to see um, how much of the ionization would be still uh, uh, possible. The next oh, up was... Uh, I, I wasn't uh, sharing the screen, I guess. <laughs> so. Oh, no, yeah. not, for the, not for the last part, no. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to show to John this... Um, a moment. I wanted to show to John just uh, the upper limits that we have for the full disks. And I, I just wanted to say that maybe you can look at the upper limits in this paper for the neon two and see um, uh, how much, uh, if, if they, uh, what constraint they would put on the ionization of the surface of the disk. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Daniel uh, Carrera asks, can you explain again why the outer wind would be um, a low velocity uh, component, but the inner uh, neon wind would be the high velocity component? 
Okay, so let me go back to that slide uh, here with the evolutionary sketch and I should actually share the screen. Okay, um, so here, uh, what we have here are uh, the observables. Basically, what we observe in full disks, so those that don't have a cavity and are accreting at high rate, we observe um, uh, jets, and which is manifested in our uh, data as uh, emission that is blue shifted from the star at hundreds of kilometers per second. This is what we observe. Um, then uh, for the oxygen one instead, uh, we also observe in this type of uh, uh, disks winds that are at uh, lower velocity. Uh, so they uh, seem to trace this uh, inner part of, of the wind. So the fact that um, um, we okay. don't I, see I, the neon so two. Jet, oh, yeah, go ahead. High, so basically, high velocity means jet, and low velocity means wind. And that is that basically? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, uh, hearing well. So you are asking sorry, what? I, I had to move my microphone. I had yeah, it sure. moved aside. I think I got it now. Jet is high velocity, and wind is low velocity. That's right. That's how we interpret it. I mean, That's, because these, uh, okay. these hundreds of kilometers per second, uh, they are not compatible with, uh, uh, with the wind scenario. Um, yeah, so, but there is also an, an important um, connection, I like to say, a possible connection between the wind and the jet. So it has been shown by uh, even some earlier uh, work in the 90s uh, uh, that uh, uh, these uh, uh, winds uh, uh, that are initially not well collimated, they could uh, 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 recollimate at higher distances and then they could be responsible for these, uh, uh, for, for these jets. And in fact, uh, in the paper of Andrea, he looks also at the kinematic connection between uh, jets and winds and defines uh, some uh, interesting relationship which points to the idea that these phenomena are somehow physically connected. Right, thank you. The next question in the chat was from Mario. Uh, he asks, can the absorption of X-rays by the disk wind explain the evidence of a lower X-ray luminosity in stars with disks with respect to stars without disks? Uh, well, in our case, uh, let me see. the absorption happens in a higher creatures. Um, I'm not sure. I have to think about that. I, I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. I can answer that if it's Uma. Ah, okay. Go ahead, Uma. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that actually, my, as far as I understand, in disks which have, um, uh, which, which which have disks, there's accretion, and because you know, it's believed that the accretion then generates these absorption columns, which uh, absorbs the X-rays out. And that's basically what leads to these, uh, you know, to uh, lower X-ray emission from those objects. And this is especially true of the software component, which stems from accretion. But in, in disks without uh, disks, then there is the usual, uh, you know, chromospheric emission that then, and without any accretion, which sort of does not cool the plasma down. So it's a completely different thing. And this is, that is really much closer to the star. I hope that explains. Thank you, Omar. And I think the last question is from uh, Mikael again. Uh, he asks, how do 10 million year old transitional disks fit into the framework of wind-driven dissipation? Do the timescales work or is there a late onset trigger? Yeah, I mean, this is a very good question. Uh, um, I, I mean, we don't know really how these uh, wind-driven uh, accretion disks uh, evolve. I mean, if you look at this uh, figure from uh, by in 2016, uh, right, it depends a lot on the evolution of the magnetic field, uh, which 
we actually don't know. So I think there could be a variety of outcomes uh, there, but uh, more theoretical work I think is necessary. Okay, thanks. Um, Uma, your hand is still raised. Does, does that mean you have a question or? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I have to lower that. I didn't do it. Oh, okay, no, no worries. Um, I think in that case, if there are no further questions, uh, gone a little bit over, so I suggest we all unmute, uh, and give Ilaria a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I will see you uh, next week. Yeah, thank you everyone Bye. for coming. Thanks. See you next week. Clap, clap, clap. Oh, there's more applause in the chat. Okay, thanks. Yeah, our, our